Okay, so uh, um, a, a very good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Hedren. I'm actually from the NTU Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity, Nanyang Techno Technological University, Singapore. Right. So I'm I'm very happy to be here today, and thanks for everybody who to join us. So um, uh, this is the Metaware series, uh, where uh, we explore how technology how technology mediated body experience transform human and defabric society by bridging the gap between physical, digital, and biological worlds. So today we are having our fifth, I believe, yes, fifth, fifth talk. Um, uh, yeah, and and you we can and today's session will be recorded. Uh, and we can actually uh, visit the past recordings of our previous talks uh, through the website, which I'm actually copied in the chat, right? So today we have a very interesting talk by Dr. Steve uh, Thorn, uh, who is from the School of Art, Media and Engineering at Arizona State University, right? He's an American violinist whose research encompasses interactive design and philosophical approaches to computational media, right? So today he will be talking about Variable music and trans acoustic violins, new paradigms of particip participatory and relational variable computing. Right. So, he, in this talk, he will be discussing how to bridge the experience of the burying of uh, co corporal boundaries in live performance in the domain of variable computing. So, without further ado, I will now like to pass on the stage to the staff for his interesting talk. Hello, staff. So Over to you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, can we enable screen sharing so that I can show some slides as well? I'm trying to do that. Okay, here we go. All right, let me just share my screen, share the sound. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about two projects today, uh, wearable music, uh, which I've been working on for a couple of years, and a, and a transacoustic violin project. Um, so I'm going to trace the development of my work from, from the violin stuff into the wearables. And a broad question that structures all of this is, how can wearable technologies and tangible computing scaffold intercorporeal awareness? That's the primary theme. And how can we leverage this in research creation, artistic practice, um, and in learning environments? So I'd like to talk about all of these. So um, I'm, a, I'm a violinist um, by trade. Uh, that's, I've been playing for decades. Um, and the, the, the first project I'm gonna show here is just a sort of your classic wearables project, which is a, a glove. Um, it's a glove I made, but it's actually really adapted and specialized for violin playing because there's four sensitive resistors and, and um, on the inside of certain fingers that I can actuate and press and, and play with a little bit while I'm bowing. Um, so it's, it's really adapted to, to violin playing. Um, I'm going to show just a little clip of a performance at TEI, ACM TEI, a couple of years ago. I'm just improvising and playing sound into this into the, to the microphone. It gets picked up by the computer. There's some signal processing. It comes back out, and I just improvise and, and play with it. So let's listen to that. So the, the next project I worked on after this glove um, is something that's quite new. Um, 
And some, some of you might know this if you ever played the violin, but um, violinists use something called a shoulder rest because the violin sits a little bit low on your collarbone and a shoulder rest just props it up a little bit. Okay, so there's less space, your, your neck doesn't bend down. So it's an ergonomic support and people have been using this forever. And there's a typical form factor that uh, showed up maybe three or four decades ago and I don't know, 80, 85% of violinists use this, something like that, very big number. So I took mine and I installed two actuators on it. So two little voice coil actuators, you can see it in the picture there. I just bored out some holes and put those in there. Um, and this creates a really interesting result because previously, you know, I was processing the sound on my, on my uh, computer and it's come out, coming out of the speakers in the room. With this, now the sound is also coming through the shoulder rest as this vibratory energy, and I feel it. Okay, I feel it on my body. Um, but I also, if you, if you increase the gain enough, you also start to actuate the violin body itself so that you start to have new sounds that are coming out of the violin that aren't produced by your bowing gestures. Okay, so this creates an active acoustic instrument, um, and this is very rich, right? And then Beyond this, if you, if you bring the gain up even more, then you end up with feedback because some of the sound you're producing gets picked up by the microphone again. And then it comes back in the system and it gets processed over and over and there's this process of feedback. And at this point you have a complex system and a field of attractors that you navigate. And this is very fertile um, for improvisation work. So I'm just gonna show a little bit of, of this, what this sounds like. So it's a demo reel that, that goes on, but I just wanted to show a little bit of it. So from there, um, I created a new model and this one's 3D printed, um, built from the ground up. And if you, if you look at the picture on the right here, you can see the actuators that are flat on the bottom of this new model, but there's some other things here as well. There's a, there's a speaker and there's some tiny speakers on the sides that you can't see that spatialize the sound a little bit. Um, so what I've done here is, yeah, I have, a, have an, an array of speakers that are co-located with the violin. They don't actuate it, but they pr produce sound that's around the violin. And then I have the actuators, which give me the haptic feedback and actuate the violin and have this potential for system feedback. And so then when I'm composing, when I'm composing these effects and writing the signal processing, I can uh, do things that are very, uh, very particular uh, especially if I'm also um, making sound come out of some speakers that are in the room. So now you can compose the sound that's around the instrument, the sound of the room, or the, the acoustics of the room, the way it feels. You can compose the, the haptic qualities, what's coming out of the violin, and you can link them all together and have this energy and the sound being flowing through the environment, like multimodally. You know, it becomes haptic and then it becomes sound and it comes back out and you can just have it evolve and move around. It's really hard to describe what this experience is like, but it is, it's, it's bizarre. That's one way to describe it. It's very different. It's really enticing and interesting and I love it. Um, so it's given me a lot to play with. Um, the signal processing I do is, is very elaborate. You can hear these things I've constructed are, are you know, these are big effects. There's a lot of layers of things happening. 
Um, but I also want to make this appeal to more conservative audiences who, who might be interested in just hearing like a piece by Vivaldi that's just has some something tiny that's added to it, just like a sparkle, some resonance, or just just something, some fairy dust that just makes it sound kind of enchanted. Um, another thing that's really interesting to do that's that's very uncanny is to put, put the sound through a tuned filter bank with all these resonant peaks. And this makes you feel like the actual physics of the violin have changed, like it has new resonant qualities. So this is a really powerful tool. Um, and I'm calling these active shoulder rests. Um, and I'm, I'm working on a big project um, to, to scale up development of these. Uh, and I'll talk about that um, in a second here. Before I get to that, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the thinking here that I bring to this by comparing what I'm doing with the, with the enigmatic origins of the violin, which I think is a really rich thing to reflect on. Um, so there's a, 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 not a very well-known philosopher, but it's becoming more well-known, Gilbert Simondon, who is a 20th century French philosopher of technical evolution. And he describes technical development as a process that moves from abstraction to something that's concrete, okay? from abstract to concrete. So I have a picture here of, of a violin table. Okay, so the top of the violin, and there's a piece of wood that runs along the back. And this piece of wood is called the bass bar. And it's located beneath the base foot of the bridge. And it does a couple of things. By putting it beneath the base foot of the bridge, you greatly enhance the lower frequencies of the, of the instrument. I mean, it really enhances it. It becomes the violin, very powerful but it also supports the table so that it doesn't collapse under the weight of the strings, which is something like at least 50 pounds of pressure. But the way the bass bar developed was as a thickening of the back of the violin of that table so that it wouldn't collapse. Gradually, it became this independent piece of wood. And then somebody shifted it over in some experiment and realized that it completely changed the sound and made the violin what it is. So in that experiment, in that little improvisation, you have this quantum leap, this sort of spontaneous moment where the violin itself crystallizes and that nobody anticipated. And it's all about the, the potentialities in the material that are uncovered through an abductive process. So abductive meaning that you're not working from a model, you're just tinkering and experimenting and playing with the material imminently. And I think that the shoulder rest that I'm working on is kind of like that now as well, because it's becoming functionally more synergetic and richer. It's adopting multiple functions. It's actuating the violin and it's lifting up and it's, it's doing more and more. So uh, I think this perspective of, of tinkering and the style of working and, and thinking about the potentialities that are there that you can't anticipate is really, really important um, in many ways to the work I do and to the wearable music work. And I like to carry this style of thinking also into how I understand the way I develop the signal processing for the instrument. Because what I'm doing when I'm developing this, making these sounds, making these transformations, is I'm just playing with things. I'm, I'm trying little bits of code and, and changing things and picking up the violin and, and trying things in a different way and revising all of this without a model. Okay, I'm not building a generalized model. I'm just building a personal musical instrument. I'm creating the feature vectors on the fly. I'm deciding what's salient about the sound as I create the sound, right? What, which um, energy bands are relevant? What kinds of attacks are relevant? And because this is a multimodal instrument with the haptics and the sound, what's happening here is an increasing uh, symmetry between action and perception. So I'm symmetrizing action and perception. And um, if you think about the inactive approach to cognition, action and perception are undifferentiated, right? The idea behind this approach is that you have to move in order to, to see and you have to move in order to feel. It's all about moving in the world and enacting a sensory apparatus on that basis. And this is an idea that I'll bring up again uh, when I talk about wearable music. Um, but the bottom line here is that everything crystallizes in the actual design process the tiny decisions that produce a very highly refined instrument that's built without a model. 
And I think this is an important perspective to bring to wearable computing projects, the style of working and, and refinement. So the last thing I'm gonna show here um, is just this quote that's very nice that kind of captures this from Deleuze and Guattari. Um, we talk about uh, following a flow of matter and they're, they're distinguishing the act of following from the act of reproducing. Okay, reproducing means, follow, means reproducing a model and being distant from the material. When you're following, you're right up against it. So they say it's a question of surrendering to the wood and following where it leads by connecting operations to a materiality, materiality possessing a nomos. This word nomos um, comes from the Greek root nem, which means to distribute. So the nomos is this inhomogeneous distribution of matter. And, and Deleuze also connects this to the idea of nomadic science, nomads. So moving through an inhomogeneous space, okay, that's nomadic movement, following where things lead and staying very close to the material. That's what it means to refine a multimodal personal music, personal musical instrument using real-time signal processing. So um, I wanna think about this more with the wearable um, music as well, but I wanna show first uh, this, this project that I'm doing now to scale up this work. And this was recently funded. Um, I started a project called Remix and Reprogram the Violin with Rests. So this is an exciting project. We have a lot of um, ASU faculty on board. We have a bunch of artists from the community who work in all different kinds of styles of music, R&B and classical, and um, just a, a big mix, electronic. Um, and so what we're gonna be doing is building a set of active shoulder rests and, and doing a qualitative design study and passing out a kit into the community, moving it through different youth music organizations and outreach organizations, having it stay there for a couple of months and then moving it to a new place. And we want the students to just get these active shoulder rests, these ASRs, you know, just give them to them, give them some tools, you know, some software and some things, and maybe some information about what to do, but really back off, you know, pull back the, the schoolification, the learnification, the pre-structuring and everything, and just see what happens. And we're gonna, um, our data collection will be based on um, self-recordings from students. So they're gonna do self-recorded videos and, and remixes. And we wanna see people work together and see if this doesn't um, start to blur some of the differences between popular and classical music cultures. There's all kinds of different things you can do with these active shoulder rests, ASRs. I mean, you could tether your violins together. I could play and that energy be, could be coming out of someone else's instrument. They could feel it and respond and play something else. And it can go through a lot of different ways. So yeah, tethering your, your violins together. How does this change um, what it means to embody the violin? So this is an exciting project and we'll, we'll be doing it uh, next year. It's getting started right now. Um, there's a few organizations that we already have on, on board. These are, these are unofficial, but these are all people we're talking to. And, um, and there's a website too, so violinasr.org uh, that you can go to if you wanna get more information about it. So that'll be fun. Um, the last thing I wanna show before I move on to the wearable music stuff is just a video of me um, playing a, a very, perhaps the most famous work for the solo violin, which is um, J.S. Bach's uh, Chaconne from the second partita. Um, this is a, a very well-known solo work. And I'm taking it and playing themes from it and, and reprocessing them and, and putting it through my system and really extending it and um, in this effort to, to suggest how people might you know, take classical repertory that they know and transform it. So I'll just play a little sample of this. Thank you. 
have the my little logo at the end there. So just shameless plug, but there's my logo. So I'm going to move on to the next project here, wearable music. Um, and I really, I like this, I like this term. Uh, I like the polyphony of the word wearable, right? Because it's music that you wear. Um, and the, the impetus for this project is me wanting to take the refinements that I had with my violin system, the, the really sensitive uh, you know, structures I had developed for you know, tracking bowing motion and things like this, and decoupling from that violin, but retaining this interesting stuff about the torsion of the arm and the elasticity of the bowing arm, and taking those elements and you know, making it available for other people who aren't playing the violin. Um, and a big part of this for me is thinking about relationships between time and movement and how movement and moving differently affects your sense of time. So I'm just gonna, this is some, this is just preliminary stuff that I, that I did, you know, in the studio when I was just starting out. So I'll show a little bit of this, a couple of examples. Another thing that's really important that I'm pulling from my violin work um, is the idea of entrainment. Okay, so I take entrainment here to mean broadly a system that both retrospects and anticipates activity, and not in a cognitive, not in a cognitivist sense, in the sense of the machine discerning your intention behind the gesture, but you know, like in the way that waves form in a body of water, something like this. Um, and entrainment turns out to be very important in telematic music, because if you're working with entrainment, then latency is a false problem. You can step into a rhythm or you can have something that's, uh, you know, a little bit out of phase with you, but it's so compelling that you start to move in phase with it, something like this. So I've, I've done telematic uh, wearable music projects as well, and I might have time to talk about that, but I'll show you here just an example of what I mean by entrainment. So having a lot of fun with that, and that's just the violin gesture, right? Bowing like crazy. So everything's everything's violent, violin for me. Um, so I took these instruments, these prototypes, and I started working with a, a dancer and a choreographer, um, Haley Wilcox, who's done choreography for Sojourn Theater, which is a, a national theater that, that does public process and participation. And so I took some of these instruments and gave them to her, and we... I developed some software to make it really easy to kind of adapt some of these, these uh, effects. And, um, and I wanted to, and I also talked with her about expanding this, like getting more people involved. Um, so this is my initial work with her. And then after this, I'll talk about collectively playable wearable music. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. So this is where wearable music started to get very interesting. Uh, collectively playable instruments is what I'm gonna talk about. So what I wanted to do, what I kind of got bored of um, was uh, instruments that are very highly individualistic. Okay, that's what the violin kind of was. And that's what it is to put something on a solo dancer who just moves around. And I think in the wearables community, we, I mean, obviously we do so much with embodiment, but we're beholden to this normative model of the cognitivist intentional subject, okay? What if you set that aside? What if you set that aside and instead you take an inactive approach, this inactive approach to thinking and to, to cognition, whereby cognitive structures emerge through ongoing sensory motor couplings. And a great way to explore this is through collective dance improvisation, because the experience there is very much about the blurring of individual and collective intention and volition. Um, the experience that dancers describe is this, is this switching or flickering even between leading and following so that it's hard to say what's happening if you're, if you're moving or being moved becomes almost undecidable. So to facilitate this, I developed uh, some software. I developed a software system that would allow you to design an instrument for one body. Okay, so for one sensor, you can make it very rich and, and just very refined. Okay, so one person, it's easy to do that for one person to, to do that development. But then you can turn around and replace each of the features with an aggregate statistic, you know, like mean or variance or something like this. So you can quickly turn an instrument for one body into an instrument for a whole group of people that's, that's based on aggregate statistics. And uh, this starts to become very interesting because if you take like the variance of the heading, you know, where people are looking, where they're pointing, then that becomes or can become a kind of index of their attention. You know, where are people looking? It might suggest something about what they intend to do. Um, and if people start to get a sense for the sound conveying that information, then you have this inactive thing happening, right? You have these cognitive structures, these new sensory structures that are beginning to emerge as people learn this. So um, this is just a video that shows uh, some dancers working with these instruments um, and, and just learning them and adapting them. So one thing that we discovered that was really interesting um, kind of experimental result is that uh, we can really condition what happens in these events 
using some non-intuitive couplings between movement and sound. So in particular, what, what was really rich is if you invert the relationship with sound and movement so that a certain small amount of movement enlivens the instrument, brings it to life, but then too much dampens it and causes it to dampen for a certain period of time. And there's a kind of gap, you know, there's this delay where it becomes more enlivened again and has more potential. So this was really interesting because when we tried this mapping, it really tuned in the dancers to the space and to each other. Because if anybody moves too much, everything gets quiet. Your individual mappings, your instrument goes quiet or you know, is quieter. And this brings an attentiveness. This, this brings a, a group awareness. People look around, they listen, you tune in, you retune if you've, if you've kind of checked out and you get a more hyperbolic sensation of being together or being co-implicated. That's what the dancers uh, described. And this is interesting. This has experimental value because it conditions how the dancers move and how you can condition their attention and their behavior as a group in predictable ways. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting principle to, to pull out of this. And in fact, I'm, I'm bringing that into a different project that I'll uh, discuss here in a second um, that, that is all about figuring out ways to bring this attention together. So I'll show a little bit of this. This is just a demo from ACM MoCo that we submitted. Um, I'll, I'll show it. We hosted a series of workshops in which dancers explored ensemble experience and improvised events by participating in the design of collectively playable, wearable musical instruments. We discussed the progressive phases of layering and computationally creative learning that occurred during our workshops with epistemically and culturally diverse participants. Our approach is motivated by processual and experiential design and a relational approach using collective sonic mappings. We outline a pre-reflective, pre-individual, less semantic approach to relational media synthesis. So I think the last thing I'll show here, since um, it looks like I'm running low on time, is uh, what that project, uh, how that project got scaled up into this, this big grant. So um, we got the attention of the NSF when we proposed this less cognitivist approach to wearable music as a learning modality that is more amenable to neurodiverse experience. Um, neurodiversity uh, is a, there's a lot of different ways to, to talk about it here. I'm gonna talk about it as a perspective that proposes that the world is composed of relations, of relations of care and facilitation, rather than being composed of individuals and independent self-sufficiency and autonomy. Okay, that's the baseline, these relations of care, facilitation. Uh, the neurotypical perspective is an ideology about an, an autonomy that doesn't exist. Okay, that's, that's the claim. And this is interesting because this is basically what wearable music is about. It's about leveraging these networks of relations that create playful and interdependent group dynamics that shape the attention and the intention of the group. And so, um, in our grant with, within that, we're embedding CT concepts that are embodied and emerge from these playful embodied activities, but we're also leveraging the pro-social aspects of, of sensory motor coupling. You know, when you move together, you merge and you become more comfortable and you talk. So um, eventually, and this is the next phase of this grant, this is a three-year, $1 million NSF cs all grant, the next phase is to scale this up to telematic embodied learning. So to see if we can bring some of the stuff that happens in the co-located setting into telematic situations to increase the spatial and social affordances of, of being at home and working with these wearables at home. 
So I'm going to show just a two-minute video here that's uh, that's going to this going to the IEEE Respect Conference actually next week. Um, we're hosting a panel, um, but I'll I'll show this video and then I'll I think I'll leave it there. Especially some of our, our, our lower verbal kids, they're like, oh, when I do this, you know, it makes this sound. Or when I do this, it makes this sound. They really picked up on it. They, they got it. The first time Jessica moved, their eyes just went, oh. I mean, you just. It's exactly what we wanted. I thought it was a really cool feature, actually. Okay. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, that was a really fun project. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, that's the most recent work with wearable music. So thank you. Um, be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Steph. Thank you so much for the, for the, for, for, for the talk. Uh, yes, we do have some time for questions. And I'm actually wondering, are there any questions from the floor? Yeah, uh, Pat. Yeah, um, thank you, Seth, for this wonderful presentation. I have a question about, um, you know, I mean, I think it was really interesting about the, the relationship between you and the machine. I'm curious what happened after you, you know, go back and, and uh, use sort of a more traditional violin, for example, and no longer have this sort of like, you know, uh, closed loop feedback. Does it feel like losing part of your body or, you know, like, does it feel like kind of losing part of your prosthetic or, or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's an that's an awesome question. Um, you know, a little bit, and that's a mm -hmm. good sign. Like because it's yeah. never felt it's never felt that way. It's always mm -hmm. been really clunky and and honestly just kind of awful trying to set up everything, get it all plugged in, the microphone, the levels, and all this stuff, and feeling like you have this extremely heterogeneous assemblage of stuff that doesn't right. really go together. That's you know has no consistency. And so what I think this, the shoulder rest has brought is, is, yeah, this element of consistency, sort of paving out a space in, you know, to, to work, almost like, like making a field for athletics and dance. You know, new things can happen when you have a field. And I feel like I have a field now. Um, and yeah, finally, I finally have a field. So yes, it's, it's, it's been transformative, yeah. And what was your experience when you like kind of go back to playing a regular violin, for example? Does it feel different than before? Yeah, yeah you know, it, it, it doesn't, I don't know if it feels different, but it's, it, they're just, they're very different experiences. Mm -hmm. And I do, I, I, I do feel a difference. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've gotten used to this other one and then I go back and it, and it feels different. But, you know, the kind of expressive things and I'm wondering if this will always be the case, but the kinds of expressive things I do with just an acoustic violin are different than the kinds of expressive things that I do with mm -hmm. one that's heavily augmented. Oh, you know, wow. The way I lean into it or what I pull out of it or the, the, the kind of expression is different. And I would like that to 
merge. Uh, someday I would like that to really come together. And that's, I think, what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, we have a next question uh, from Timothy. I had a question of where do you see the future of wearable technology going and how do you see it getting more accessible to the general public? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, because the kind of work I'm doing and especially in the middle of the pandemic, you know, I, I taught a course that that's called wearable music and I had to teach it during the pandemic. So all of a sudden it became an issue of finding technology that was off the shelf, that was accessible for students, so they could get it going and, and work with it and we could kind of improvise with what we had. And so I've always kind of had this, this perspective about trying to get people involved and you know keeping costs down. And now that's really easy to, it's because like the ESP32 is really, it's like you know a couple of dollars and, and you can really, um, you can have a bunch of those for cheap. Um, so for the kind of stuff I'm working with, this IoT stuff, it's becoming really available and very inexpensive and ubiquitous. Um, I, I definitely want to see, I want to encourage my students to develop instruments in the way that I develop them, which is to spend time really refining and going after this kind of nomadic science with where you're not following a model, but you're tinkering and exploring through trial and error and getting these highly developed instruments on that basis. Like that's kind of what I want to see. I want to see it as a minor citizen science that evolves in a, in a, in a captivating way. Um, that's where I come from when I'm, when I'm thinking about this stuff. Um, I don't know if I have a, a vision for like the big, big picture, but that's where I am right now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think that's a very interesting point that, that um, you know, the, the pandemic actually allows us to uh, provide us with a different perspective to look at the things or, or, or things that, that, that we actually do in, uh, you know, in pre-pandemic times, right? I'm just wondering if you have some thoughts about, you know, uh, the digital world. Right, the impact of the of, 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 of the digital world where you know you, you can actually connect with somebody across the continent like like, like now actually right in uh, in your field in, in this new field of variable music yeah yeah so the telematic aspect yeah. yeah yeah so that's that's really interesting um you know so when I when I had this this class uh, this this wearable music class I taught, basically we treated it as a kind of space to explore um, a, a lot of different ideas that we came across. So we went back and we looked at online orchestra projects. You know, we read about those and we saw like what worked and what didn't work. And one thing that didn't work that people didn't like was having a conductor up there who's, who's conducting, who's like this rigid timekeeper. Okay, people didn't like this idea of the abstract metric synchronizing person who was keeping time. They wanted to have that be something that was emerging. Okay, so that was one thing. Um, another thing we looked at was we, we tried to think about, you know, what is the minimum signal of connectivity? What's the minimum signal by which you discern that someone is doing something intentionally, you know, and can you do that with wearable music? And so we went back and we looked at some of the participatory sense-making experiments, um, you know, in, in um, cognitive science. And there's there's one that's about putting people in, in two different spaces. They can't see each other. And they move their fingers along this strip, okay? And, and, and they can feel when they cross, right? They feel when they cross, there's a little click, a little pulse, but there's also like a little, there's also a lure that's attached to their finger that's like a little decoy, you know, and there's some fixed object that's there as well. So there's little decoys and things to try to fool you. So you're moving your finger, you're moving the cross and you're scanning. And eventually, if you come up, find the person's finger, what happens is you start to, you enter into a coupled oscillation relationship. You start mm -hmm. to scan each other and you start scanning and then you perceive the intentionality. 
So we tried that. We, we tried that with, with wearable music. We, we made sounds and brushing sounds and, and closed our eyes and, and, you know, worked across the internet and saw if we could perceive, you know, a person versus something else. And, and um, you know, that, that wasn't a very rich experiment, but it kind of got this, con- conveyed the, the idea about this minimum signal. Mm. But through that class, we did develop some techniques that were really helpful to make us feel like we were together. One of the most important ones is to turn off Zoom, you know, literally mm-hmm. just turn it off, you know, and go into an ocarina situation where you're just hearing, you're just, you're like, oh, somebody's moving, somebody's doing something. And there's no other telematic sense that's connected. You know, there's no screen because no matter what, if there's a screen, you will just look at it and be obsessed with it. You just turn it off. That was one thing. Um, we, we figured out that entrainment works really well. Entrainment is quite powerful. If you have, if you, let's say you have periodic movement in train and oscillator, then actually this mitigates the the latency problem because as you're in training that oscillator, you will start to move in phase with it because it's so close, you can't help but do so. So entrainment was another way to get rid of the the latency issue, you know? Um, And we, we explored all kinds of different paradigms. You know, I could ramble about this for a very long time, but other things like, um, it's really important to have instruments that are scalable where people can, because, you know, pe- there's all kinds of contingencies. People disappear, they're coming in, they're, they're online, they're gone. You have to have instruments that are adaptable to changing numbers of people. And you have to create models that fit that. And so like models of resonance, like um, uh, Tanaka's global string, if you guys know about that, you know, th- these kinds of models are very helpful for, for that. But there's a lot, there's a lot of things. I have a paper that, um, was published in Wearable Technologies in, in the Cambridge Journal um, uh, a few months ago. And it basically summarizes a lot of those techniques that we explore. Yeah. But it's a great question. There's so much to think about. Mm, thank you. I was yeah. actually thinking about Galina's uh, telepathic red dress, right? That, that, that she actually created some time ago. So, Galina, do we like to share something about it? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually going to ask said because when you answer Pat's question about merging um, the whole experience I was wondering how you can use clothing to have this immersive feedback throughout the whole body Mm. and using textile as a connective tissue you know connecting and embedding computing concepts as a collective collective playable instruments. I don't know how we can use textile and clothing on our body to, to do that. Yeah, well, mm, I do. I remember the telematic dress from 2008, 2008. I know that was yeah. amazing. Yeah, well, you know, there, there, there are some, there are some really simple things you can do. You know, the, so some of those aggregate statistics that we looked at, you know, they were useful. And I think we, we tend to be really, we tend to take the body as being like this absolute thing. You know, we'll put an EEG on someone and then have them sit or, you know, be using galvanic skin response and all of these metrics related to the individual body. But it's really interesting if you take those and maybe look at the differences or how they're changing with relation, you know, in relation to one another those kinds of things. And if you, especially with like EEGs, you know, don't, don't have people just like sit, have them get up and start moving around, you know, the the movement and and something like this. And I think that those dynamics can suggest interesting things that will make people feel together. You know, moving together is so critical to getting that going. It creates this kind of pro-social situation. People who move together feel more intimate you know they feel more connected um so i think that's important to bring in yeah thank you so much absolutely incredible enlightening talk i really enjoyed it and you are amazing musician it's a pleasure to listen i also came across to a book here um, from a melbourne based um, musician patrick teffer he published his books, Telematic Music. So maybe I can write that down and it will be good for you to explore and to see maybe it's a way for you guys to collaborate. Absolutely. 
music, yeah. It's yeah, a yeah. collectibles of improvisations. And I think was uh, conceived during the lockdown as well. So mm. like Kidran says, lockdown gave us a lot of opportunity to explore more than we're supposed to explore mm. in everyday life before. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So, oh, uh, okay. yeah, so we have a couple of minutes uh, left. Uh, I, I just wondering, are there any other questions on the floor? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, are, are there any uh, final thoughts, Ted? Yeah. Well, I, I, I just wanted to... Uh, Thank you for inviting me to this. This was a lot of fun and a great opportunity to talk. And um, I look forward to coming to these on Wednesday um, because this is great. So that's my final thought. This is a great event you put together. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, OK, so maybe what I will do is that I will do a little bit of um, a promotion uh, for our next talk. Um, so our next talk is actually by uh, Laura Fulano from IIT, and uh, she'll be sharing something about uh, cyborg disability, and it will be happening next week on the 25th uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, Arizona time. Yeah. Okay. So um, looking forward to join. Uh, looking forward for, for all of you to join us as well. Uh, and I would also like to share. Um, uh, so-called a competition that we actually organizing <clears throat> called the Global Digital Art Prize. Uh, <clears throat> it's basically open to anybody in the world. Um, um, and uh, this is our second time running this. It's a, a, it's a Binale kind of a competition. And uh, this year theme is on uh, humanities and sustainability. Um, so we are actually looking at uh, basically anybody, uh, you know, including artists, scientists, engineering, uh, engineers and technologists to actually submit to, to this um, uh, uh, contest, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, so basically, I, I will just copy and paste the link into the into the chat and looking forward. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I would like to thank uh, thank Steph once again for for your enlightening talk, um, and uh, thanks for joining us, and thanks for everybody who joined us today um, uh, for this uh, uh, dialogue. Yeah. Uh, Galina, and are there anything else to say? Yeah, you would like to add? And Galina, you're on mute. Oh, same. I just want to say thank you to Seth for the enlightening talk. Thank you, Hidden, for moderating. And I cannot wait to hear Laura's presentation next Wednesday. Mm. So, Me thank too. you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thank everybody. you, everyone. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.